Right, this uh, talk is on the control of multi-input, multi-output processes, and in particular in using decentralized control as a control strategy. We'll be looking at process interactions, uh, closed loop interactions, uh, decentralized control, pairing of controllers with a manipulated variable, and tuning of multi-loop PID control systems, and also seeing what problems we get in terms of multivariable control strategies, why maybe decentralized control isn't quite so good at decoupling. Let's have a quick look at a decentralized controller. This is where one input controls one output. So if this is the output Y1, then we have U1 controlling it. This is the output Y2, we have U2 controlling it. And this is called a decentralized control strategy. Now the thing about a decentralized control strategy is we could have swapped these round and we could have had U1 controlling um, Y2 and Y1 controlling U2. So there'd be two possible strategies now. One is this pairing, but we could also pair loop this one round to here and pair that one round to there. The question is, which is going to be the better? But one thing is once we've set up a decentralized controller, we'll get a if we do a set point change on this variable here and nothing here, we'll get this transient response in the output y. And then this is the bit, this is what's called interaction on y2. In changing one variable, say y1, on a set point change, the other variable will also be affected. This is called interaction. So it's the interaction of y2 due to y1. And then this one is a set point change on channel two. So this is Y2, and this is the interaction on channel one. Now, in a multivariable control system, we're looking for two things. One is to minimize these interactions. Secondly, to get a good performance in the closed loop tracking. So in multivariable control, it's not just about closed loop tracking, it's about minimizing interactions as well. And interactions occur because of their nature of the multivariable control system. Now, in terms of controller design, it's the standard differential equation, closed loop state space equations, A minus A, BKC, and we're looking at the eigenvalues of A minus BKC to be stable. So that's still our stability consideration. And so when we design our controllers, we have to bear that in mind, otherwise they won't work. Um, and then we can go for something called decentralized control. Decentralized control is the simplest multivariable controller. And it's where you have one variable, one control variable to control one output. And the simplest one would be where the controller was just a diagonal matrix, then U1 would control Y1, U2 would control Y2, U2, U3 would control Y3, and all the way through. But this might not always be our ideal control strategy. So, we potentially could have a permutation matrix here now, whereby we could use pair. This is say pairing uh, U1 with Y4. It's pairing U2 with Y1. This is pairing U3 with Y3. This is pairing U4 with Y2. So you can have different pairings now by having different permutation matrices in there. Obviously, there's a whole family of permutation matrices, and the question then becomes, which is the best permutation matrix to choose? So, so we've got this configuration here. We could choose the configuration where P is like this, which gives us this following structure. Or we could choose a P like that, which are the two opposite ones. And this time we've got Y1 controlling. got uh, Y1 controlling u2 and y2 controlling u1 so this is swapped around so the question then becomes if we've got two controls we could have which is going to be the better now in some cases it's easy to design a decentralized controller and in some cases it's not so easy so if the interactions are small the g0 is close to diagonal then we can expect to have not too much of a problem It'll almost behave like single input, single output systems. However, if the interactions are large, G0 is not diagonal, then we have to be look at the situation much more carefully. And some controllers might not work, and some controllers 
might not work very well. And the controls might actually work quite well. So we need some design techniques now for assessing how to design our best permutation matrix. So to give the best performance of the closed loop control system. Now, this has been looked at and um, the solution that's come up with is you compute something called a relative gain array. And this is a relatively simple calculation to do. You work out the steady state gain matrix G naught of the system. So that's your multivariable transfer function matrix with S equals naught. And then you invert it and transpose it. So this is the inverse transposed of this matrix here. And then you work out elements of the relative gain array by multiplying now this number here by this number here to give you the first element. And the second element here multiplies by the second element to give you the third element. The last element times the last element here to give you that element. And say that one times that one gives you that one. That one times that one gives you that one. You can do that for every single one. And this gives you what's called the relative gain array. Now this relative gain array is very interesting because any row or column in this relative gain array always adds up to one. So um, it turns out now this relative gain array is very useful for selecting loop pairings. And let's have a look at an example here. Here's the G naught here. Here's the G naught to minus one. We can then transpose this matrix and multiply it by this one element at a time. So we can multiply, say that by that, multiply that by that, that by that, because it's be transposed in our final analysis. And then that would give us this thing called the relative gain rate. Now, having computed the relative gain rate, we can check it because every row and column has to add up to one. That's the first thing. And then when we come in to choose loop pairings now, we can only choose positive numbers from this array to choose as loop pairings. So if you look at this, there's a positive number there, so you could choose that one. Positive number there, so you could choose that one. Positive number there, so you could choose that one. So this would be a potential loop pairing now, because it's picking up those positive numbers there. If we tried for a different loop pairing, let's say choosing this one here, so we put the KP one there. We then notice once you've chosen that, You've got to choose one of these two could be positive, would be OK. Then you've got to choose one of those two and they're negative. So that's telling you that would not work. So in this particular case, the only pairing that will work is the diagonal one that picks up these three positive numbers to give you a permutation matrix, which only matches to positive numbers in the relative gain array. If we look at a little example here, here's the G naught. And we could then work out g naught to the minus one, transpose it, multiply it element at a time, and we would get this matrix here. This is relatively straight to do in MATLAB. And this is G, you put a dot after it, times inverse of G, transposed with a dot. The dot command does element by element multiplication. So one, one multiplies by one, 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 two multiplies by one, two. It's a handy little trick by putting the dot in. It gives you a quick way of generating this relative gain array. And that comes out as this. And then you can see from these, these negative numbers, these positive numbers, it all adds up to one in the row or column. And so the only pairing that picks up positive numbers are these two here, which means that this is the only controller now that will work. The other one won't work. Here's another one. One, two, minus three, four. Relative gain array comes out as this. And this time, we could have this one or this one. So both of these will work, but probably bigger numbers are more successful than smaller numbers because it's indicating you have more effect on the variables this way. So this controller is likely to be better than this one. Um, here's another one, uh, just sort of randomly chosen numbers almost. Uh, in this case, when we come to carry out the relative gain array, it comes out to a very large number e to the 16. And this is indicating now that the G naught is ill conditioned. And because it's ill conditioned, the relative gain rate starts giving you very big numbers. 
This indicates the power process is going to be difficult to control. Um, let's go for another more simple example. Here's a relative G naught here. We could then work out the relative gain rain if it come out as this. So we can now choose positive numbers. So we can see we can choose that one, that one, and that one to give us this one here. Or we could choose that one, that one, and that one. So that could give us a second one. There are potentially six that we could have, but only these two will work. Because uh, if we, we can't choose that one because it's a negative number, or that one, or that one. So we're restricted into two controllers. And you want to go for the ones with the biggest numbers in. So you can see that the six here is good. That's definitely good. Um, the two is quite big here, so that's quite good. And that one's not so big. You could go for that one as well, which is the five, the six, and the five and a half. So probably this is might just have the shade because you've got six, five and a half as compared to six, two, and 0.375. We'd have to try both out to see which worked, but probably that one would work slightly better than that one. Um, here's another one. Um, so some more numbers here. This is G0. This is the relative gain rate. This time these numbers would work because they're positive. Um, there's six of these. Out of the six, then four would work. You could pick up that one, that one, and that one. You could pick up that one. That one and that one we could pick up that one that one and that one so we'd have four potential ones that would work the ones with negative signs would be ruled out so anything with that in would be ruled out so you'd have that that and that or that that and that but they would be ruled out because of that negative sign so in this particular case we could have four controllers that might work again we'd be trying to choose numbers with the biggest number so look that one that one and that one we've all got quite big numbers in so chances are that would be our best controller. You could only really tell though by carrying out simulations. So here's a little control system. Uh, and this is the relative gain ray. So on this one now we can see we could have either that one or that one. So both would work, but probably this one work better than that one. So if we look at the performance now, this is the relative gain ray. And this is the sort of performance we get out using this configuration. So Got quite fast responses here. There's a fair bit of interaction, but these responses are quite fast. If we go for the opposite configuration, which is where we swap the variables, then uh, this time we've gone for this configuration here. Now we've had to detune the control system performance quite considerably. So they're detuned, and there's still significant interactions in the system. So it's showing that that configuration was better than this one. Um, Here's another example here. This is a where G0 is, uh, this is the transfer function. We could work out um, G0 and the relative gain ray. That's indicating now that only this configuration will do. So this one would work. This one is our K. This is our K wouldn't work. And again, that's how we could work out this relative gain ray. Um, this is showing that that system with this type of controller in. And this is some sort of set point tracking on channel one and the thing on channel two. So it's showing it's stable and working. In this one, I've chosen the opposite configuration. And this time, no matter what I do in terms of my controller gains, I'll never be able to achieve a stable response. So it never goes stable because the relative gain array for this was like this. And so only that, that diagonal, only this one's going to work. No matter what you do, you can't make the other one work. So um, the performance of decentralized controls is usually OK. Um, but there might be significant interactions. The technique for designing it is to use the relative gain rate to choose the pairings. And then that will give you the best possible configuration for decentralized control. But the main problem with decentralized control is that you can get significant interactions. So these interactions here can be quite big with decentralized control. So in order to improve the controller, 
we can try and design what's called a centralized controller, which not only gets good tracking in the control system, but tries to minimize these interactions here. So it tries to make these interactions as small as possible through, to, through a sort of more sophisticated control system design. And that leads us on to a centralized controller. So the centralized controller has potentially say four controllers, whereas the decentralized would only have two. And these extra two controllers that you're adding in, they're essentially trying to cancel out your interactions. So then we have the control system design problem of a centralized control system design to minimize the interactions in the control system. And so we're trying to minimize these interactions by getting a good performance here. And that then becomes the design of the centralized controller, which is the subject of the next lecture. Hi, good afternoon again. So today we're talking about decentralized control. And as a little example, we've got this little setup here. Here we've got a multivariable transfer function and we've got two possible controllers. The first one has got the controller as a diagonal matrix around here. So we've got U1 is KP1 times error one, U2 is KP2 times error two. So that's one type of decentralized controller we could have. The second type of controller we could have was U1 is now a function of error two and U2 is a function of error one. So the question is, which of these two controllers is most suitable? And that's what we're going to look at in the design of the decentralized controller. But just before we do that, I thought we'd just have a quick recap on multivariable poles and zeros as well. And we can remember one of the important equations is that the determinant of GS is given by Zs over Ps. This gives us an expression now for a multivariable system to work out the zeros and the poles. And this is very vital in multivariable control. So we can have a go at applying that to this particular system here. So a determinant of GS will be that times that minus that times that, because that's the GS there. So that's going to give us 1 over S plus 1 squared minus alpha over S plus 1, S plus 3. Now, I'm going to, have to bring this under a common factor, which is going to be s plus 1 squared s plus 3. And the top line will be s plus 3 minus alpha into s plus 1. So this gives an expression for the multivariable poles. So there's 1, 2, 3 poles, 2 at minus 1, 1 at minus 3. And this gives us an expression for the zeros. So we can take this expression now and rewrite it as s plus 3 minus alpha s minus alpha equals 0. There's our expression now for our zeros. We can rearrange this as s into 1 minus alpha equals alpha minus 3 by taking that and that onto the other side. We can then take this underneath here, give us an expression that s is alpha minus 3 over 1 minus alpha. So now as we vary alpha, we can have different zero locations. So for instance, when alpha equals 2, then it'll be 2 minus 1, which will be, so zs will be 2 minus 1 which will be minus 1, over 1 minus 2, which will be minus 1. So that's equal to 1. So when alpha equals 2, the 0 is at plus 1. So this is a non-minimum phase zero because in the right half plane, so this is quite difficult to control. Let's say that we had alpha equal to 3. So in this case, the zero will be three minus three. So Zs will be zero over three minus one. 
be two, which means a zero is at the origin. Now, if we've got a zero at the origin, the control system is not possible to control, so we call it functionally uncontrollable. So if we end up with a multivariable system with a zero at the origin, we can't actually control it into the sense that we can make it carry out set point tracking. And that's a false constraint on any multivariable system. If we look at one more example, when alpha equals four, then the zero this time would be four minus one, which would be one, over one minus four, which would be minus three. So this time the zero would be minus 0 0.333. So with a negative zero, this system now becomes relatively easy to control. Because the zeros quite dramatically affect the type of performance you might expect from a multivariable control system. So this is an important expression. GS is ZS over PS. Work out the determinant, get your expressions for your zeros and for your poles. Now, in decentralized control, coming back to our example here, we want to figure out now which of these two controllers is suitable to use as a controller. Now, sometimes both are suitable and sometimes only one. So, in order to do this, we can compute something called the relative gain array, called the RGA. And to compute this, we have we work out G0, which is we get by putting s equal to zero into this transfer function and then we do a cross product with g naught to the minus one transpose now this type of multiplication is an element by element multiplication what that means is if you've got a matrix two matrices and it's giving a third one then you multiply that one by that one to give you that one Multiply that one by that one to give you that one. You multiply that one by that one to give you that one. And you give multiply that one by that one to give that one. So when we're working this thing out, we work out G0. Then we work out G0 to minus 1. Then we transpose it. And then we multiply them elements at a time. So that one times that one to give us that. That times that to give us that. That times that to give us that. That times that to give us that. Unfortunately, somebody's phoning me up, but I just ignore them. So we can apply this now to our system. So if we put S is naught into here, we get uh, the G naught. So G naught comes out as if S is naught, that becomes one. If S is naught here, becomes alpha over three. If S is naught here, it becomes 1, and if S is naught here, it becomes 1. So now we have to work out the inverse of this matrix. And it will depend now on the value of alpha. So in this particular case, I'm going to choose alpha to be 2. So I'm going to consider the case alpha is 2, so that can become 2 in there. So the first thing to do now is work out the inverse of this matrix. So swap these two around, change the signs on these, and divide by the determinant. So G0 to the minus 1 will be given by, I've got this over here, 3 minus 2 minus 3 and 3. So there's our G0. There's our g naught to minus one. We then got to transpose this, so that means this row becomes that column, that row becomes that column. So that becomes three minus two minus three three. That now is g naught. This is g naught to minus one transpose. We now multiply them element at a time. So one times three is three. Two thirds times minus three is minus two. 
1 times minus 2 is minus 2, and 1 times 3 is 3. So I've multiplied that one by that one to get that one. I've multiplied that one by that one to get that one. I've multiplied that one by that one to get that one. And I've multiplied that one by that one to get that one. Now, once you've got this matrix, this is called then the relative gain array. And looking at this matrix now, that if you've done it correctly, each row and column adds up to one. So this is clearly correct because it adds up to one, each row and column. And to choose your decentralized controller, that's going to be this one, this one, you have to choose positive numbers associated with this matrix. So the only positive numbers are that one and that one. So that implies that the only controller that will work is this one. So they've picked up the positive numbers, and so in this particular case, we, we could say that we've got an option between two controllers. This one would work, so that would be good. But this one definitely wouldn't work, so that would be bad. And this is how we can use the relative gain ray to determine which decentralized controller to use. In some cases, these numbers will add up to one, but be both less than one. So you could end up with situations like 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.4 in a different situation. So again, the adders, add, numbers add up to one, but in this particular case, you'd probably go for the bigger numbers rather than the smaller ones. So the bigger numbers would indicate for this particular system that this controller might be more efficient, but you could use this one as well. And the closer these numbers are to one, the more probable it is that's the best controller. And that's the basic thinking behind the design of decentralized controllers. All right, let's have a look at this example again, and maybe in a little bit more detail. So here's the multivariable transfer function GS. Here's the G0, and here's the relative gain array. And this is telling us that only this controller is going to work, whereas this controller is not going to work. Let's just have a look how we assess the performance of this and see it work. So here's the multivariable transfer function setup, and we've got some PID gains set up here. So what we tend to do is we go here and put a set point change on this channel and no set point change on this one. And then we choose some suitable PID gains. They're not really suitable at the moment, but then we run the simulation. And this gives us the performance then on, this is variable one tracking, and this is the interaction on loop two. So you can see there's about 50% interaction on this. So there's, it's quite an interactive control system. We can then swap loops. So if we put the final value of this as zero, and the final value of this as one we can now see the performance on the other loop so if we run it again and if we look at the performance this time this is the other loop tracking now and this is the interaction here so if we try and improve the performance here it will happen but we'll probably pay the price and the interaction will get bigger if we want to make the interaction smaller We'll have to detune this system. So say that interaction, say the performance now is a bit disappointing. We might say, well, we can, we can sort that out by putting a bigger gain in here. So we could go here now for a gain, let's say two and two, even not 12, two and two. So we've now got a bigger gain on this loop. If we run the simulation again, we've now got a faster performance but we've paid the price by an even bigger interaction. Um, and if we go even higher performance again, so we go for, should we risk it four and four? So we should get higher performance in the control loop this time. But now we've got, so we've got faster performance, but now we've got almost 100% interaction. So, if we wanted to reduce the interaction, we could reduce the performance 
and then that would reduce the interactions, but we can't get a win-win here. We can't increase the performance and reduce the interaction. Um, if we put slightly bigger gains on this one as well, shall we? Should we put these up to say three and three? And now I put do a set point change on this one. So put the final value as one, put the final value on this as a zero, and then run this. So now, so now we've got. I haven't changed one of the variables here, so have quite a look at this. I've still got a final value of one on this, so I didn't put the zero in. Okay, so run it now. And again, I've got this is the tracking, which is a little bit strange here, but we've got significant interactions here as we say improved speed of this one up these interactions will get even bigger so if we went for even bigger gains in here um so we went for should we say four and six and then again then again we, we've now getting into sort of a stability problem, aren't we? This, the interactions are really big and quite oscillatory, and this is quite a oscillatory response as well. So as you tune the thing up, you're likely to get big interactions and you could get stability problems. Now, one of the things about this system was that this configuration wouldn't work. Let's just see what happens if we were foolish enough to try that one. So if you go back to a simulation, we need to swap the loops now. So if I take this loop here out, cut that one out, and cut this one out, and then switch now loops. So I take this one now, and this one, and this one onto this one. So I've now got a, the alternative configuration now. I've now got this one set up as opposed to this one. And we can now have a little look at the performance of this. So uh, I dread to think what it's going to look like, but well, this is a, when we're doing a set point change on channel one and nothing on channel two so we can run this and you can see it's just gone unstable here and no matter how much we detune it so so we drop the gains here to let's try 0.1 and 0.1 so much lower gains to try and regain stability over it again we drop these gains as well down to say 0.1 and 0.1 and then we're just going to run it over a longer time now because that's going to be much slower run it again again you can see it's just going unstable so no matter what we do with this that configuration just never works so this configuration now is the one that the relative gain array told us it's going to be a disaster because it's associated with these two negative signs and this is how it manifests itself in terms of the performance that sort of looks like it's going somewhere and then all of a sudden it just sort of zooms off and stable um, and that's a typical situation it might take quite a long time it, you could be sitting there for about a minute and you wouldn't be too worried but after two minutes you'd be pretty worried you could see it was just going away We've lost control of the whole situation and you'd be slightly red in the face because uh, four or five minutes down the line the whole control system might have blown up so if we go back to our original configuration we can obviously state restabilize this so if we cut that one and cut this one and then put them back in um, like this because the low gains now when we come to run it the performance will be slow um, but the interactions are there's still quite big interactions here really but they're the interactions are as big as they were because we've got lower gains if we uh, just change the set point on this to zero and this one to we need to put, do both channels really to see the performance and the interaction in the two channels this is with very low gains. Again, this is tracking. The interaction is smaller now, but it's still in the region of 30% uh, 
because uh, it's a, quite an interactive process. So that's giving you some idea now about the simulation and performance you might expect to see from a decentralized control system and what happens if you choose the wrong controller loops.